a year of crushing failures. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Maureen Callahan in the Daily Mail has provided a detailed summary of how the last year has really shown how wrong it has gone for Harry's wife. It's a useful pulling together of all of the failures, which will also provide us with an opportunity to understand how will a narcissist deal with all of this. The article is entitled, Harry and Harry's Wife's Annus Horribilis of Karmic Disaster. Maureen Callahan's devastating analysis of how a string of crushing failures since the Queen's death 12 months ago have shattered their narcissistic dreams. To paraphrase the late Queen Elizabeth II, this has been an annus horribilis for Harry and Harry's wife. What was meant to be their year of triumph, telling their truth and finding their voice through multi-million dollar deals with Netflix, Spotify and Penguin Random House, destroying the monarchy in the process, has backfired spectacularly. Of course, Harry and Harry's wife likely don't recognise this. Never will they allow reality to intrude upon their delusions of greatness. But the rest of us have witnessed the most satisfying karmic comeuppance since Alec Baldwin's downfall. How poetic, how fitting, how sad that Harry's wife's rapid descent began one year ago, days before Her Majesty's death on September the 8th, 2022. The timing for Harry's wife in particular could not have been worse. Here she was, in Wallace Simpson cosplay, on the cover of New York magazine's The Cut, the accompanying profile, one great whinge fest, and then, oh, how her narcissism so quickly metastasized. Harry's wife compared herself to Nelson Mandela. Delusion. Grandiosity. I just had Archie, Harry's wife began. It was such a cruel chapter. I was scared to go out. Pity play. That's our Duchess of Despair and Endless Grievance, who somehow gathered the courage to see the Lion King, and was greeted finally as the heroine she is, the revolutionary, the freedom fighter among us. Backstage, a South African cast member said Harry's wife told her, I just need you to know, when you married into this family, we rejoiced in the streets, the same we did as when Mandela was freed from prison. Delusion, grandiosity, revision of history. As the Mail exclusively reported, the production's lone South African cast member said, It never happened. I have never met Harry's wife, actor John Carney told the Mail. This is something of a faux pas by her. It's baffling me. Mandela's grandson was less forgiving. Every day, there are people who want to be Nelson Mandela. The grandson said, Get out there. Pull up your sleeves and better the lives of ordinary people in England and in the United Kingdom. Oh, how the cut profile gave and gave. Reporter Alison P. Davis, herself a woman of colour, treated us to this exquisite moment. At one point in our conversation, instead of answering a question, Harry's wife will suggest how I might transcribe the noises she's making. She's making these guttural sounds, and I can't quite articulate what it is she's feeling in that moment, because she has no word for it. She's just moaning. Has there been a more revealing celebrity profile? Harry's wife apparently faking non-verbal agony, then verbally explaining how she'd like her non-verbosity depicted. That's as fraudulent as it gets. The following week, the Queen was on her deathbed, and reports emerged that Prince Harry was fixated on Harry's wife accompanying him to Balmoral. It was an outrageous demand, sense of entitlement, the royals refused. When Harry finally arrived, he was alone, and it was too late. This humiliation was followed by a deeply unpopular Harry and Harry's wife, booed at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee in June, clutching hands as they joined a shock walkabout with William and Kate, the soon-to-be Princess of Wales, shooting a death glare Harry's wife's way. 
see parts pass him for how the Princess of Wales dealt with all of that. Unbowed even this moment of national grief, the Sussexes shamelessly approached President Biden's staff asking to hitch a ride home on Air Force One after the state funeral. Sense of entitlement, lack of boundary recognition. Non-starter, a source told DailyMail.com. Another said the White House prioritized the royal family. It would have strained relations with the palace and the new king. So much for that rival court in Monty Shit Show. Next up was Harry and Harry's wife's highly touted Netflix documentary series, a six-part howler that showed Harry and Harry's wife fleeing in panic from non-visible paparazzi, delusion, paranoia, what a folie de along with intimate iPhone footage of their engagement and Harry's wife's description of meeting Queen Elizabeth for the first time. I mean, Americans will understand this, she said. We have medieval times, dinner and a tournament, it was like that. She then recreated her first curtsy to the Queen, a deep mocking bow delivered with a smirk. This insult was filmed before Her Majesty's death, as they clung to her for legitimacy. Even Harry looked pained. Really, though, what could he say? One month after that Netflix doc came his misery memoir, Spare. Meant to be reputation-building, instead it read as petty, cruel, and unself-aware. Well, naturally... He's been affected by the influence of his wife. The disabled female teacher whose limitations Harry ridiculed and who he castigated for not making him horny, the nuclear spill of information such as his father's medical ailments, Kate Middleton's text messages, the revelation that he and his brother are circumcised, that they also begged Prince Charles not to marry Camilla, the smashed dog bowl, he broke my necklace, the smaller bedroom and breakfast, Harry's frostbit and todger, truly no piece of information was privileged. No one's privacy left untrammeled. Tiny slights recorded as if they were human rights violations. Spare, too, became a laughing stock, immortalised in a note-perfect South Park episode just one month after the book's publication. Harry and Harry's wife depicted as huffy little upstarts on their worldwide privacy tour, promoting a memoir called Wah! They claimed not to have watched, yet called it via a representative, totally baseless and boring, nullification of threat to control. The world begged to differ. If ever there was a moment that cemented these two as vainglorious fools, South Park was it. In March, Charles offered an olive branch, officially granting Harry and Harry's wife's children the titles Prince and Princess. It was also a stroke of strategic brilliance. How, now, could the couple possibly refuse an invitation to his coronation on May 6th? Ever defiant, or cowardly, or a bit of both, Harry's wife declined. Assertion of control by staying in a position of withdrawal. Harry went alone, seated in the third row, looking lost behind a resplendent William and Kate. He was there for 28 hours, flying in and out, with no public sign of rapprochement, of genuine happiness for his father. Harry's petulance, viewed by millions the world over, had become officially insufferable. One makes one's choices, a source close to the royals told Vanity Fair, adding that the family wondered why Harry bothered to come at all. Two weeks later, these renouncers of regality were in New York City, where Harry's wife was honoured at the Mrs. Foundation Gala's Women of Vision Awards. Minus a royal advance team, our Duchess entered the venue via rental car offices, a perfectly down-market backdrop for a duo in decline, her strapless girl dress complementing that blaring yellow hurt sign behind her, Harry's wife grinning madly as though this was her rival crowning, Richard's grin drawing up the fuel. I was there that night. It did not go well for the Duchess. Not one attendee I spoke to mentioned her as a draw, as someone they were eager to hear from, as a role model or aspirational figure. The biggest star in the room was a peloton instructor. Harry's wife's speech at the end of a very long night was met with murmurs and rustling. A weary crowd gathering their belongings as she offered word salad with the side of flaming hypocrisy. Change is just one action away. You can be the visionary of your own life. Daily acts of service in kindness, in advocacy, in grace and fairness. Kindness? Grace? Fairness? Oh, the irony. Hours later, Harry's wife and Harry claimed they were the targets of a two-hour-long near-catastrophic high-speed chase that night. 
and Mother Doria with them in the back of a New York City cab, barely escaping with their lives. Again, to cite the late Queen, recollections may vary. I would find it hard to believe there was a two-hour high-speed car chase, New York Mayor Eric Adams said. I don't think I would call it a chase. Their actual cab driver, Suk Chan Singh, told the Washington Post, I never felt like I was in danger. That was it for Harry's wife. Invoking the circumstances that contributed to Princess Diana's death was a new irredeemable low, a reputational dividing line. And their hits just kept on coming. The next month, Spotify announced they were dropping Harry's wife's insufferable podcast, Archetypes, and cancelling the couple's $20 million deal. Spotify executive and podcaster Bill Simmons branded them fucking grifters, before roasting Harry as useless and boring. Shoot this guy to the sun, Simmons said. What does he bring to the table? He just whines about shit and keeps giving interviews. Who gives a shit? Who cares about your life? You just sell documentaries and podcasts, and nobody cares what you have to say about anything unless you talk about the royal family, and you just complain about them. Simmons said what many of us were thinking. Soon after, a rumour somehow surfaced that Dior may be on the brink of signing a deal with Harry's wife, only for the company to quickly deny it. Days later, Queen Camilla was photographed wearing, what else? Dior. Even Harry's Invictus patronage, proudly displayed in a just-released Netflix documentary, no longer redounds to his benefit. If anything, it's the opposite. Harry complaining yet again on the backs of these wounded warriors, men and women who have lost limbs and the ability to walk, that he didn't have any emotional support when he returned from Afghanistan in 2008. Harry's wife is barely present in the series. She and Harry don't appear to be as glued at the hip as they once were. Failure upon failure upon failure. Even the strongest of couples would find such losses challenging. And what happens when their next masterstroke doesn't work? What strain will that put on their relationship? What Harry and Harry's wife are selling is something the public no longer wants to buy, truly can no longer believe. And Harry's wife, a striver bent on continual self-reinvention, appears to be desperately planning her next chapter. Do you want to know a secret? Harry's wife told the cut last summer, and getting back on Instagram. A year on, how many estranged royals does it take to press post? Harry's wife is about to make good on that threat. Reports, as usual, unsourced, say she'll likely earn a million dollars per brand endorsement. She'll need to, because money is surely running out. Harry, as a prince of the blood, can always return to the royal fold. Harry's wife, however, will always need another story to tell. A detailed run-through of everything that has gone wrong for the gruesome twosome, for the despicable duo in the last year. But how would a narcissist deal with all of that? Well, quite simply, she compartmentalises. Her narcissism prevents her from accepting that any of it is her fault. That is quite a comprehensive list of clusterfuck behaviour. And any of you who are listening to me now would think, yep, I can see failure, 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 failure. Fuck up, fuck up, fuck up, fuck up. How can she not? Because you're asking somebody who's blind to see. She can't. Her narcissism will not allow her. With each and every instance that's mentioned there, she will reject what you have to say. That man the South African cast member, he said he never said it. Well, I think he must be lying, because I do remember him saying it to me. Maybe someone's got to him and have bribed him so that he said he didn't say it. But maybe her likely response. Why didn't you go to the king's coronation? Well, I had to stay and look after the children. Harry went, of course, he represented us, so I don't see what the problem was there. Do you not think that your curtsy that you showed on Netflix was discourteous to the Queen? No, I was simply showing what I did. Why are you getting so bent out of shape? At? I'm the one that should be upset, you know, after all the hate that's been poured my way, and you're doing it again, picking me up, just because I did a little joke about how I curtsied to the Queen. Each and every instance that you will put to her will be parried by her narcissism. It's as if you're driving a sword thrust towards her, 
and her narcissism will bat it away again and again and again and again with a variety of defensive manipulations. The revision of history, denial, the insistence that she was correct, pity play, circular conversation, whatever it might be. She simply is incapable of recognizing and accepting that she has fucked up. She'll either deny that it's a fuck up or where she can see that it is, it's down to somebody else's fault and nothing to do with her. She can't help it that people are horrible towards her when she's done nothing wrong. They're the ones that they are the problem. Of course, what's happening is she is moving towards obscurity, which is where she belongs. But she is not going to change her ways because she can't see that there's anything to alter. The typical behavior of a narcissist. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.